shame. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to think about it. Nobody wants to experience it. Shame is... Downcast eyes, hunched body, collapse. Well, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, we experience it here. We experience it most intimately. Shame brings us up dead in our tracks. Stops us dead. And yet, it's not a fundamental emotion. It's not something which is, and this is completely counterintuitive because it feels completely me. Shame is all about me. And yet, shame is actually the most social of our emotions. It's kind of the sticky glue that sticks us together, me and you, but also them, the others, and we'll talk in a minute about why it's me and you and the others. It sticks us together in a particular kind of configuration of difficulty. Which we don't want to talk about. We don't want to hear about. And above all, we don't want to feel. And if in one sense... Our whole practice is about turning towards, turning away, coming to understand what it is we're turning away from, coming to understand why we're turning away from it, coming to understand the effects of this turning away in the world, then really we have to talk about shame. But shame itself is shameful. It's weakness, it's vulnerability to admit to shame is to open oneself to damage, open oneself to heart, to hurt. Who wants to feel shame? Jacob Beck in Ordinary Wonder has a wonderful description of the experience of shame. She's actually talking about core belief, her idea that there are these fundamental beliefs we acquire in childhood that we then kind of figure about and deny, but which, which run us. Don't want to talk about core belief as such this evening, but this is just her description of Presumably during South End, but any time, finding, finding what it is, finding that place. If you dig enough, if you meditate enough, there it is. When you really see it, it goes bing, and you know that's it. It's always, always painful. It's like you're about to vomit. It's that awful feeling it's that's the one when you feel something like a punch in the stomach that <clears throat> then you know you've got it and with that great awful feeling is the beginning of relief because it's not hidden anymore you're beginning to relieve yourself of the tension of hiding this core belief but we'll come back later to whether this might be the beginning of relief for the moment i just want to concentrate and emphasize this deeply physical, deeply emotional experience of, well, it's shame. And if we look at the form, the kind of formula of these core beliefs, they're all basically variations on, I'm worthless. I can't do anything. I can't 
achieve anything. I'm, actually, I'm unlovable. I can't. And that hurts. That really hurts. That feeling pulls us up dead in our tracks. It stops us dead. This is what we call a global judgment. And this is, okay, let's get technical just for a minute. Shame, in the sense that I'm talking with it, is the most intense, the strongest of what we can talk of as a whole range, cluster of self-conscious emotions, which we don't really have good names for. And in fact, even experts, psychologists and philosophers use them completely indiscriminately and inconsistently. So, I'll use the words that make sense to me. They may come across completely different. The point is that these are very closely related, but significantly different things as well. So, kind of at one end we have embarrassment. Red flush. Oh, oh, I'm uncomfortable. I, maybe I tripped and there was somebody there and they saw me and they laughed or what, you know. We'll have embarrassment. We'll, that kind of, oh yeah, it's not a disaster. It's, uh, it's shown. It's, uh, it's difficult. But that's okay. It's about what it's about. No lasting damage done. Then there's, well, closely related emotions we can call guilt, we can call remorse, we can call regret. That's when there's something specific, a specific thing I've done which I acknowledge, I can own, was a bad thing. I mean, maybe I'll fess up to it, maybe I won't. Maybe I'll admit to you, maybe I won't. But I know, I know this was not a good thing, I know I shouldn't have done it, and Actually, because it's a specific thing, hopefully I can make it better. I can do something. I can offer something. It might be an apology. It might actually be doing something to change back the thing which went wrong. Specific, focused, doesn't involve me in my entirety. And then the shame. Real shame, true shame, deep shame, which is about me. I'm worthless. Well, of course I did that. Of course it went wrong. That's me. That's who I am. Different people experience shame in this sense to a different degree. They experience it differently. There are, we know people have done research, there are gender differences, whatever, and we'll, we'll touch into some of those as we go on. I'm fairly confident this isn't the only time I'm going to talk about shame. So, we'll lay out the ground a little. We'll probably come back to all of this. But let's get back to this real deep shame, the kind that Joko's talking about. And her contention with the idea of core belief is that this is something we all, we all have, we all know, we all share. And we might not even want to admit to that. In fact, we quite probably don't want to admit to that. And again, what do we do? We'll go anywhere rather than actually own this shame. And clearly in that piece that I read, what Joko was talking about was owning that shame, really experiencing fully as a full physical manifestation while I'm sitting and the accompanying emotion. And, you know, sometimes we're forced into that, but we can move sideways. We can move sideways into anger. We can move sideways into sorrow. We can move sideways into just plain denying it. We can move sideways in so many different ways. We can start talking about it, start explaining it very fast and consistently. So in actual fact, we're not really experiencing the emotion at all, but I can absolutely explain to you in great clear detail why well, either I shouldn't be feeling shame at all or how dreadful it is and how awful and, you know. Because the point is, yeah, this shame is always, 
all about me. And that's entirely consistent with the way that Jokobek is suggesting that this comes to be. And in fact, what I'm going to suggest this evening is that that's not the most helpful way of understanding it. So, on this version, we have little me, infant me, toddler me, certainly very, very young me. I am this nascent ego. I am this self-contained identity. And I struggle. I struggle with the world because the world doesn't always obey me. And because I'm imperious and I think I'm the ruler of the world, that's frustrating. It's difficult. It's difficult to be confronted with the reality that I don't control this world. In actual fact, of course, I'm completely dependent on my, my caregivers, primarily my parents, probably, but certainly the, the adults that are there to look after me. This is difficult. Rather than actually face this lack of control, this frustration, I come up with this idea that, well, actually, I'm in control, but I'm just bad. It must be my badness, because these wonderful people there to look after me couldn't possibly, or it couldn't be their fault, so it must be my badness. And so, immediately, I'm in a beautiful little bubble. I'm completely hermetically sealed off from the world. It's my badness that's put me here. I'm still in control of it because it's, it's my badness. I've owned that much. But what I'm not owning is the experience of the shame because this model is an attempt to control it again. And what's interesting is that this is a kind of idea of the child as a mini adult, idea of the child as a self fully formed, in opposition to the rest of the world. Me, me, me. And of course that was very much, if we're thinking of, I don't know, the 40s, 50s, whatever, was very much in line with prevailing models of child development. Um, the imperious, you know, let's say it, boy child, out to conquer the world and facing difficulties. How dreadful that mother doesn't always obey him, doesn't know what he always wants, she doesn't she understand that's what women are there for, etc, etc, etc. There's a different way of looking at this. There's a way of looking at it that says, hang on, really, coming to be me is relational. It's something I do in relation to my parents. I emerge out of this fundamental bond of we. More or less undifferentiated. And there's this figure there. And we play games. And there are rhythms of give and take. And I slowly begin to understand that there's in one sense a me and a you and that we're the same but we're different and this sense of oneness sorry of individuality of meanness emerging out of us out of a we and of course this relationship the other person in this emerging relationship isn't in the same situation as I am they are already a fully realised social being. They are an adult who's part of a society. They speak a language. They have relationships with other people themselves. They're in a particular place within that society. They're a man or a woman. They're younger or older. They're black. They're white. They're highly intelligent. They're deemed to be a bit stupid. All of these different possible configurations which delimit 
and determine who this person is, where they're coming from. And out of that relationship, out of their sociality, I emerge. So, in this sense, it's all relationship. In this sense, what's fundamental is recognition. Our mutual recognition, our mutual understanding of each other as a center, a center of emotion, a center of intention, a center of love, offering and receiving reciprocally. So where would shame figure here? Shame would figure as the temporary breaking down, the interruption of the evolution of this recognition mutuality. Because in actual fact, you need three at least to be ashamed. Let's think about this. What is, what is really this feeling of shaming about? What is this? It's a judgment. It's a judgment that I make on myself. But I don't make this judgment in isolation. I make this judgment because there's a real you out there that's shown me that I should make this judgment. And the reason that you can show me that is because they, we in the big sense, but they, society, has said implicitly or explicitly, usually just implicitly, this is how it is, these are the rules, this is the script, follow the script, obey the rules. And that might be something quite specific, that we probably all assent to, you know, don't shit in public, not a good idea. You've done that, Ugh. disgust, disgust face. You are bad. There is this bad thing happening. Why do I show you my disgust face? If I'm your parent here, we'll assume. Why do I show you my disgust face? Well, because I'm ashamed that you did that. I'm ashamed that you did that because everybody else will be disgusted that you've done that. I know this. I did it when I was two. Everyone was disgusted. I am shamed because you shame me, usually because you experience shame, or at least the potentiality of shame. And again, we've got this, well, you probably don't experience the shame. What you're doing is deflecting the shame. Shaming me saves you experiencing the shame. Go, ah, no. I've moved it aside. I've moved it on to you. And I have taken it. It's a social judgment. I have no option. I mean, I can say no. I can say I don't accept that. But the disgust face is there. The judgment is there. And of course, in time, I learn to make my own judgments about everything. Except they aren't my judgments, they're our judgments. And if they're global judgments, and this again, we come back to this difference between something like remorse, regret, and shame. Judgments which seem to reflect back on me, just as the person I am, because I am this way. I experience that shame and I don't want to experience that shame so it will go sideways. If I've experienced that regularly enough it will probably start to manifest, well interestingly if I'm a man it may well manifest as rage, sudden violent outburst and if I'm a woman it may well manifest as well actually long-term depression not necessarily, but that's often the way it goes. And again, we're talking 
differences in the way that people are raised, difference of expectations. And so shaming actually has this intimate connection with control. To be shamed, to experience shame, is to be vulnerable. It's to be still part of society, but to be pushed to one side as the unacceptable, the bad, the wrong. And the point is, this is, well, you know, if it's not our parents doing it, and sorry, the really bad news is we've all done this to our children time and time again because we learnt it and we learnt it good. But even if we didn't, even if we were so wonderful that we never shamed our children, there are so many other people only too desperate to step in and do the shaming for us. Grandparents, other caregivers. As soon as we're at school, I mean, that's a, that's a, a shame catastrophe, a shame-a-thon. Shame unlimited. And you can be shamed, well, not quite for anything, because this is where the rules are really subtle, isn't it? You can be shamed for any difference from your group or an ideal or, well, pretty much anything. Any shaming around sexuality seems to be particularly potent, but any, you know, any difference we can find or imagine, any difference we can create, because again, and this is the lesson of emptiness, this is the lesson of Zen, these differences, they're not really real, they're differences we find and create significance in. Again, whether that's man, woman, old, young, genius, stupid, whatever, there we find, we use this difference. And so it's no wonder that shame works along lines of gender, it works along lines of race, it works along lines of sexuality, because it's a way of teaching us the script. One of the most effective ways that I was taught to be a man, manifest a man, perform being a man, was shame. We sit like that, not like that. We gesture like that, not like that. We blink in a certain way, we hold our head in a certain way, you know, you know the deal. And of course that runs straight through into ethics and how we should behave, whether we're moral, whether we're upright according to the lights of our social group. But it goes right down into that most intimate, most intuitive, most immediately reactive stuff. And this is the interesting thing, isn't it? This is the most social of our emotions. This is the set of emotions which bind us to each other. And yet, they're so intimate, so immediate, so reactive. The psychologist James Gilligan, who will probably come across quite a lot, working in prisons in Massachusetts in the later decades of the last century, concluded, and I think correctly, that all the violence he saw in prison, and he was working with almost exclusively male prisoners because it's almost exclusively men who are physically violent, that almost all the violence there could be traced directly back to the avoidance of the experience of shame. Dissing. Putting shame on other people, not taking shame, reacting to that. Either violence as a manifestation of a resistance to shame, or just a simple reaction to being invited, obliged, to feel that shame. That's the extreme form. And yet, 
this is a game we all play, a game we can't simply back out of, but a game we can become much, much more aware of. What do I do that's shaming? Either through what I say or what I don't say. Either through how I look or how I don't look. In my turning towards, in my turning away. Shame and recognition. Maybe, yeah, maybe we'll talk more about the positive aspects of recognition. This mutual understanding, this coming to be of relationship. But the underside of that, the underside of our relationship, the dark side, manifests so often and in so many ways, as shame. I'm unlovable. I'm worthless. And so are you. Can we come to understand our shame? Our shaming better? The good news is, it's not all about me. I'm not worthless. I'm not bad. You can make me feel bad. I can make you feel bad. But it's actually, it's all, well, like everything, it's all about us. How we learn to walk together. <laughs>